Hi everyone, thanks for joining our media and entertainment breakout. I'm gonna hand it over to our first speaker today. Steve, take it away. Thank you so much for joining um, our session today on winning the battle for consumer attention with data and AI. My name is Steve Sobel. I'm the global industry leader for communications, media, and entertainment at Databricks. And I have the great fortune of working with um, uh, all of our customers around the globe to understand how they're using the platform, but also uh, kind of how big data, AI, and machine learning is helping to uh, empower their business. For Databricks, we help companies solve some of the world's largest problems that they have, and specifically in media and entertainment, as we'll review today, there are lots of challenges that companies are having, uh, and particularly here and now, this is a very poignant time in terms of how companies' data strategies are shifting as we all live through uh, these, these uh, truly bizarre times uh, in living through a global pandemic. Um, you know, you only really need to pick up the newspaper to see that uh, we are living in uh, some very interesting times in the media and entertainment industry. And really what COVID has done is it has accelerated the pace of change uh, across every facet of media. Um, you know, there are many questions that the industry has around, you know, what is, what is the long-term viability of, um, you know, theatrical distribution in uh, the film space? Uh, how prevalent and how much of a, um, a, 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 how much growth are we going to see in the direct-to-consumer and the OTT space? Uh, how are media companies, you know, looking at the experiences that gaming companies are having in terms of driving engagement? How are they going to change how they do business and how they go to market? There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, as you can see here, you know, these are just a, a sampling of headlines from the last couple weeks. Um, you know, there, there's clearly a lot of doom and gloom, but I'm here to tell you uh, there is not all doom and gloom when it comes to the opportunities that uh, the market transformation that the pandemic is helping to drive for many media and entertainment companies. In fact, there's significant opportunities, a lot of which are driven by how companies are better leveraging their data, better leveraging AI and machine learning uh, to drive business outcomes. Um, you know, we see right now the here and now of, you know, how companies are responding to the, this disruption. You know, clearly even before, um, before COVID started, there was this massive shift to direct to consumer, but we've seen companies doubling down. Uh, everyone is either you know, accelerating the launch of their direct to consumer service. You, you see within the last year, Disney, NBC Universal, Warner Media uh, really add services, or you see services like Quibi that uh, have, are new to the market, or you see some of the incumbents that like Fox buying Tubi, um, uh, NBC Universal making some acquisitions in the direct to consumer space. Ultimately, with the goal of, you know, now that they have these direct-to-consumer platforms, how do they then drive personalization at scale and focus on having a super vibrant uh, consumer experience? Uh, you know, advertising, generally the bread and butter of the media and entertainment industry, clearly has taken a hit. That said, not to present a, a, a message of doom and gloom, we're seeing unbelievable innovation in the advertising space uh, than we've seen previous to this. Use cases around uh, driving more addressability, use cases around advanced segmentation, how do you make more effective use of programmatic as a channel, uh, both for buyers and sellers, um, ultimately with the goal again of helping to better monetize uh, both the consumer experience and drive better outcomes for advertisers. Last but not least, you know, we see customers, every single customer that we're talking to, you know, they're looking to find cost synergy. They're looking for new revenue sources. They're looking for new ways to partner and go to market. Uh, and frankly, a lot of this is you know, being, uh, being agile both in terms of your business model, but then also what are the platforms that you have to help respond to uh, these changes in market conditions? You know, many companies were agile, were ready to move quickly when, uh, you know, when responding to COVID and, and many haven't been. Frankly, it's no longer acceptable to not be ready for these changes in market uh, as we just see the pace of change within the media and entertainment industry, advertising, the MarTech world uh, accelerate over time. While that all sounds good and well, and of course, uh, uh, enterprise media and entertainment organizations want to be able to drive real-time personalization at scale. They want to be able to better monetize uh, their content and drive better outcomes for their consumers, for their advertisers. They want to execute with agility, be able to stay ahead of the business and have IT and data teams ahead of and kind of leading the business. But the reality for many companies that we work with is it's very hard meaning a lot of the companies that we work with have been brought together by years of uh, M&A activity, 
uh, you know, they're maybe experimenting with digital platforms. Uh, you know, they're having challenges around taking streaming data like Clickstream or data coming from your ad tech, your MarTech stack and matching it against batch data that might be coming from your CRM, uh, your traffic uh, data sources like, you know, Wide Orbit or Operative or, or other uh, ad serving platforms. So when we talk about really the advances that machine learning and AI can bring to an organization, getting to those use cases is very hard because most enterprises are not set up to have data directed self-service for analytics. Questions like how much is my content worth? Who's on the other side of my content? How do I reduce churn? How do I drive more return on my ad spend? These oftentimes are elusive. And frankly, you know, what we're, what we're here to say is have no fear. You know, basically what we do at Databricks is we help you take all of your data, we make it ready for AI and BI, and we do so really fast. Doesn't matter if your data is batch or streaming, whatever the systems are coming, we sit on top of uh, your investment in your infrastructure, whether that is AWS or whether that is Azure, acting as an abstraction layer to get all of your data, whether raw, whether structured, whether unstructured, make it so that it is ready, it is performant, and it is reliable for those BI and uh, AI use cases. When it comes to AI, we have a data science workspace, which again is kind of one common platform where data engineers, data scientists, business analysts can work to drive more productivity, uh, and you can bring your language of choice, whether, you know, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scala, or others to our platform in order to drive more efficiency, um, but also get more efficiency out of the investments you've made in your infrastructure. We also have um, uh, integrations to BI solutions like Tableau, Click, Looker, Power BI, and others, ultimately with the goal of being able to access all of your data anywhere, anytime. Ultimately, when with the companies that we work with, they're helping to drive outcomes that are affecting how do they drive growth in their direct-to-consumer business, or how do we drive yield in our advertising business, or how do we drive more efficiency in our content lifecycle? And aligned to this, you know, I wanted to call out a few of the use cases that we see throughout the media and entertainment space. Uh, you know, we are a platform. I always like to tell people, you know, we provide our a canvas, our customers paint the art. But if we see any patterns, you know, emerging, it's that you know our, our use cases tend to fall in three different areas. First, around audience experience, you know, this has been a core focus for direct-to-consumer companies, um, both pre and, and after uh, COVID. Things like personalization engines, uh, churn mitigation strategies, uh, uh, being under, uh, able to stand who, uh, understand who's at risk of churn, compliance use cases like GDPR, CCPA, streaming quality of service, which we find to be the foundation for anything. You know, if you're not delivering a performant and reliable uh, streaming video service, personalization doesn't matter. So we see a lot of customers, you know, that have really doubled down in use cases like this, uh, uh, again, before and after COVID. Advertising optimization, whether it is understanding, you know, campaign performance across multiple uh, platforms at the same time, understanding multi-touch attribution. If you are a publisher or a broadcaster doing advanced uh, inventory and yield management, this is a really strong area for us. And, you know, what I'd say about both kind of these audience and these advertising use cases you know, our ability to handle real time, near real time has been a, a key differentiator for us, particularly as there's been more focus on how do we mitigate churn? How do we drive a better customer experience? And how do we do so in real time? Last but certainly not least, content life cycles, kind of the, the last area of use cases uh, that we, we commonly see. These could be, you know, social sentiment analysis to improve, you know, product development. It could be how do you package, how do you apply machine learning and AI to better package uh, your content that you're selling? Uh, how do you understand, you know, if you're in the live production space, you know, how do you drive costs out of your business by ensuring that, you know, the, the crew that and resource, uh, resources that you have are, uh, you know, the most cost effective that you can put into the market. A lot of innovation in spaces here around how companies are pricing their content, how they're analyzing their content, and ultimately uh, how they're driving more uh, revenue around their content uh, over time. We have the great fortune of working with companies across the media and entertainment ecosystem. You know, whether uh, many of these brands you know, um, you know, some of the, the biggest and largest brands in the world, Condé Nast for one, you know, uh, uh, an amazing magazine publisher that is doing quite a bit with us around both their direct to consumer business and optimizing their advertising business. Uh, or what we're doing with a company like um, uh, Viacom where around their streaming business, you know, building out use cases around quality of experience in their advertising business. Uh, having use cases around uh, audience addressability and the like. Ultimately, we are helping companies move a lot faster with their data to really gain competitive advantage in the marketplace. 
And part of the way that we're doing this, we've noticed over time in the market, you know, we've had a lot of customers where, you know, we, they, we paint a vision, you know, they're super excited about it. And then it's like, how do we get started? You know, maybe we lack data science skills to be able to move quickly. Maybe it's we don't have the domain expertise or we understand uh, the ingress of, you know, uh, data that's coming from ad tech, martech, traffic systems, uh, content delivery systems and the like. Or maybe it's that, you know, there are challenges of, you know, we just need quick wins on the board. We want to invest, but, you know, we want to be able to move fast. Hearing all of this feedback, um, we've developed a program that we call uh, Solution Accelerators, which ultimately our goal here is giving customers pre-built packages that they can use, they can bring, uh, copy, bring into their own environment to get started with common use cases that much faster. If you're a, a, not a customer of Databricks, we make these notebooks available. It could be a great opportunity for you to either build a POC or experiment with you know, what our industry leading experts have built. You know, we, have, we have some of the leading uh, data engineers, data scientists, frankly, in the world. So to get their kind of um, uh, take on you know, common use cases that you would see across the media and entertainment industry. Or maybe if you're a current customer, it's a, you have a wish list of use cases you'd like to get to, just haven't had time, you need kind of a, a accelerated path to get there. These kind of pre-built notebooks, as well as our how-to blogs that we give you with the, the notebooks, are intended to kind of be 80-20. We give you the code, we give you the research that we've done on what problem we're solving for, we give you maybe a sample data set, and maybe then you plug your data in as well and experiment ultimately with the goal of moving these use cases uh, into production much faster than you would be doing uh, otherwise. We have a few accelerators that are currently available. Um, and again, we have a number of assets aligned, whether both uh, kind of our how-to blogs, the actual uh, solution notebooks themselves, as well as kind of primer decks. But um, we focused in a few areas. Number one, streaming quality of service. Again, for the video streaming space, we see this as a kind of entry-level use case on which the rest of the data science use cases follow. Customer lifetime value, we're seeing this both in a B2B and a B2C context. So how much are my advertisers worth if I look at things like seasonality, uh, in industry, how much are my uh, direct to consumer, my subscribers worth based on, you know, what is the lead source, what kind of payment uh, plan they have, what kind of package they have. So we have two notebooks around estimating lifetime, but then also estimating future customer spend. And then last but not least, we have a notebook around uh, customer survivorship and churn. So churn for any direct to consumer service is the number one priority. So really starting to understand who's at churn risk, why they churned, and how do we mitigate risk moving forward. As part of our program over the next few months, we'll be launching uh, a number more of the Solution Accelerators. So you can see here uh, in the next week or two, we'll have a Solution Accelerator around uh, sales forecasting and advertising attribution that'll be available. Uh, use cases around gamer lifecycle, content recommendation, CLV specifically for a subscription business, advanced segmentation, and, and again, you know, use case we see quite a bit, next best action, next best offer. How do we derive as much uh, revenue from our end consumer as possible? So this is something, you know, we're, we're all in, we're investing in making sure that our customers can move fast on our, our platform. We think that this is a high value uh, program that we can give to both our prospects and our customers free of charge to uh, get them in and using the platform. And, you know, if you have interest in this, we of course would love to work with you on, on uh, kind of our roadmap as we continue to develop these accelerators. To learn more about this program, I would highly encourage you to uh, visit our website. Uh, you can see it here. There's a link, dbricks.co slash media. Uh, this is kind of a, a quick, uh, quick link to get you specifically to all things media and entertainment at Databricks, uh, as well as the Solution Accelerator program. So with that and giving you an overview of uh, kind of who we are, what we do, how we help you within the media and entertainment space, you know, you heard me talk a lot about personalization. Super excited to uh, share with you uh, now and turn the program over to two of our customers that are uh, gonna deliver a presentation on how they built a, uh, a platform to deliver dynamic customer journey orchestration at scale. Uh, I will turn it over to uh, Krish Karupath and Sharad Varshney uh, from Publicis Epsilon, and they will tell you a bit more about the work that they are doing to drive all things personalization. Take it away, guys. Hello, and welcome to this presentation on how to deliver dynamic customer journey orchestration at scale. My name is Krish Karupath. I'm a Senior Vice President of Technology at Publicis Epsilon. My primary focus is on product definition and solution enablement for our clients. And I have here with me today is Sharad. Hello, this is Sharad Varshne. I'm Vice President of Data Science in Publicis Epsilon. And my core responsibility is 
on developing marketing machine learning platform. And I'll be co-presenting this presentation with Krish. Thank you, Sharad. We have a packed agenda for you today. In the next 20 minutes or so, we're gonna cover customer journey orchestration, what, why, and how of it. And we'll look at the model building and training aspects of it, as well as uh, some of the model performance and key business results that we have seen. Before we get started, I just wanted to give you a one minute overview of who we are as a company. Epsilon is a leader in data-driven marketing. We have six products, as you can see, that enable the entire customer lifecycle with the brand. The first three boxes that you see on top, discovery, prospect, and digital media solutions, focus on the customer acquisition part of it, whereas the customer loyalty and messaging focus on the customer retention and loyalty aspects of it. Epsilon is in a unique position because we have been in the data business for over 50 years and we have built customer identity graphs for over 200 million individuals in the United States with over 7,000 person level attributes. On top of that, we handle uh, data from 56% of all US non-cash transactions. And we have experience managing loyalty accounts for 600 million customers on behalf of our clients. All these capabilities enable us to deliver personalization at a scale for our global clients. How do we do that? Our solution is built on top of three core pillars, data activation and measurement, all tied to the unique identifier that I, that I talked about. It is called Core ID, which is 100% deterministic, which has very high accuracy and matching across multiple channels and devices. As I mentioned, we handle a lot of transactional and behavioral data that enable us to augment the customer information to create a 360 degree view for our clients. On top of it, our AI and machine learning models get updated fairly frequently because we have ad servers that serve billions of impressions every minute. All this enable us to deliver performance-based marketing solutions for our clients. Enough about ourselves. Now let's dive deep into customer journey orchestration. As we all know, the marketing industry is at a key inflection point. The consumer expectations are rising every day. You and I live in an always on connected world where our attention span is very short and we are distracted very, very often, very frequently. And we need instant gratification. And the technology landscape for supporting these marketing initiatives is getting highly fragmented, especially due to the compliance laws and creation of wall gardens. And this makes the life of a marketer very difficult because they cannot see the individual in, in, it, in his or her entirety. They can see portions of the customer engagement with the brand, but they are not able to get to that 360 degree view of the customer. On top of that, COVID-19 has placed additional burden on customers, especially marketers, because the marketing funds are being slashed and they're getting diverted into supply chain management and other initiatives. And on top of that, you are just one step away from losing a customer. From this chart, you can see that like 32% customers felt that one bad experience is sufficient for them to walk away from the brand. That's a pretty staggering number. Uh, how to address this? You need to make every customer interaction personal and purposeful. And it's pretty hard when we know that the customer goals are different from business goals. Customers want the brands to know who they are, respect their time, make it easy and fun for them to engage with the brand, 
anticipate their needs and give them the most cost-effective option. Whereas the businesses want to conquest customers from their competition, create brand affinity, reduce customer lifetime value, reduce churn, and increase operational efficiency. And when you combine these objectives, you can actually deliver the best customer experience. This cannot be done through data alone. You need to combine data with breakthrough creative, deliver the, the right message through the right channel with empathy and understanding. And the customer journey orchestration is all about that. And our solution promises and optimizes customer journey by detecting micro moments and delivering the right calls to action. Micro moment is an intent driven moment of decision making and performance shaping. And customer journey is nonlinear and it's complex. The customers could actually start from either online or offline. So you, as you can see from this chart, they could actually come into your store or, or, or like watch a, watch a TV commercial or go directly to your website through search or access your uh, services through a mobile app. The customer journey is, I would consider it to be a networked set of events. Ideally, uh, customers interact with your brand through the right channel and get the right experience, which is not always the case. As I mentioned, uh, micro moments influence the customer journey. As you can see, I'm not going to walk you through every step, uh, but a customer's interaction with brand is influenced by the information they have about the brand and the product and the service they offer, the brand offers. Uh, we all know that we don't always make logis logical decisions. Sometimes our, we rely on data, but many a time we rely on our judgment and we make impulsive decision based on emotions. So we need to be able to identify where the customer is in the life cycle with the brand and understand their emotional state if possible to target them with the right message with empathy. That makes the customers feel that they're making the right decision either the right purchase decision or a decision to become a loyal customer. As you can see, this is a single customer journey. However, if you are not able to recognize that the customer who is actually walking into the store and who browses your website and accesses your uh, services through your mobile app as the same individual, you're going to see three different journeys and you're going to spend three times the marketing budget to target that customer. That's a total waste. That's why identity is essential for enabling the customer journey. You need to be able to bring data from various sources, stitch these together. Uh, the various sources could include the core customer profile, then preferences, uh, your clickstream data from the website, then any social data that, about their interaction with the brand. All these data needs to be brought together and stitched together to create a single view of the customer based on a single individual identity. We call it core ID, but uh, that is what enables a successful customer journey. The next slide talks about a technical solution for enabling customer journey. This is a solution that we built using Databricks for one of our retail customers, where we had actually built a number of configurable ingestion engines and configurable MML engines and outbound engines. In ingestion engines allowed the customer to actually bring in their um, customer data and stitch it together using the configurable MML engines and algorithms to create the segments and recommendations and the channels. And then using the outbound engines, uh, we were able to actually push the right recommendation, right message to the right channel based on the use case that we were actually supporting. All this was built using Databricks on Azure. And uh, for the uh, machine learning services, we leveraged TensorFlow and Keras. And Sharad is going to talk about that 
in the next session. Thank you. Thanks, Krish. That was really great overview of our journey orchestration and core ID. Let's get into a little more into what this journey orchestration enablement looks like and how do we really see a customer uh, with all these attributes uh, showing in a 360, customer 360 or a customer journey attributes. Uh, when we put together all these machine learning models and identify a different attributes, we stitch these attributes back together, which identifies a customer or keeping a customer in a center and identifies all these attributes, which will uh, decorate their profile with their uh, on the customer journey. So for example, if we are looking at customer churn, we would run these churn model, let's say at some given cadence every month or every two weeks. And that particular uh, score, which we could define as a high risk, medium risk or low risk, that could attach to their customer journey profile as in you know, from given first month of the year versus the last month, how their risk profiles have gone up and down. So we'll take a look into this customer churn model little bit more uh, in this particular next set of slides. And we'll also look into a channel affinity. When we talk about a channel affinity, how uh, or which particular channel the customer is more active on, whether it's email, SMS, push notifications, or they like to browse the site more. Before we uh, look into the modeling, let's look an overall view of what marketing machine learning or an MML, so what we call it, uh, is all about and how do we really get into our model building and training kind of an uh, set of uh, processes. So if we talk about marketing machine learning models, we have a set of uh, tools or models based on machine learning predictiveness or a set of rule-based heuristics in some of the processes which identifies whether a customer given a certain use case, let's say in a customer churn, on uh, their retention use case, what kind of a profile they would really have if they uh, want or are uh, looking to move away from one business and join somewhere else in the competitor. We also have a text analytics based platform within uh, MML where we used uh, some of those uh, unstructured data to bring in like sentiment analysis, uh, process these unstructured text and do certain sentiment or post-processing analysis to identify whether there are some suppression use cases that we would want to enable on a segment of customers. So moving from churn to customer CL uh, TV, which is a customer lifetime value, what all factors do we want to ingrain into the customer journey so their CLV uh, gets a bit higher and higher as we move along the journey. Uh, from moving on to CLV, it's about next best action. And then cross-category propensity is very, very uh, important and significant within our MML uh, models. We have variety of propensity models taking from single, single individual offers, which are personalized in nature based on customers or what they really want to see versus just a categorical based propensities. And then moving from recommendation engine, which is a SKU level based recommendation engine given uh, thousands of thousands of products. So it could be like hundreds of thousands of products, uh, which particular products that customer has higher affinity or uh, uh, in more interest into at least uh, looking over those particular products versus buying together. So, We'll talk about one or two different models here, but I just wanted to give a bit overview of what our uh, marketing machine learning model toolkit looks like. And we are just not constrained with marketing machine learning. We are starting to expand this with the supply chain machine learning models as well, which includes the demand forecasting or multiple variations of demand forecasting model, and also adding text-based uh, unstructured data plus image processing. So a lot of uh, data getting over on social media networks. We are ingesting that back in into our platform to identify some post-processing of those uh, unstructured data. How do we really enable all this data? Because this data is at such a big or high scale. Processing these particular data takes a lot of, lot of compute behind the scene and uh, is very, uh, labor intensive as well. 
that is where we have identified some of our optimization on our architecture and we use a lot of uh, modularity based uh, libraries that we have coded by ourselves or using it from databricks uh, their compute engine or their scale, auto scalable clusters that we use for spark or data distribution processing so thinking about transactional data sets these are basically purchase orders transactions from their pos or online systems uh, their returns or the product info, they all get aggregated into what we call it as aggregation features generator pipelines. They are fully automated, uh, enabled through Databricks and Azure platform currently. Uh, we are looking to expand on different other cloud strategies as well. And once we have all these features generated, uh, in addition to, let's say there is a click behavioral data uh, is coming through our website. Uh, included with their device data or demographics data. We do that stitching, which Krish talked about earlier in the slides. Uh, whether it's deterministic or probabilistic, we have both kind of APIs at this particular point, which feeds through uh, our ER or entity resolution API and brings back into our aggregations feature generator. And this is what really enables our whole automation pipeline of MML or what we call marketing machine learning MML and all the use cases that we would like to enable for customer at risk, which is retention, our uh, acquisition versus upsell or resell, all these use cases is what we enable through this particular architecture of our MML. Now, once we have all these different models and uh, all the different uh, uh, architecture set up, how do we really look into our features? And uh, generally we talk about RFMT or RFM on a very simpler uh, mode. These are the building blocks of our features. What this RFM is, it's recency, frequency, or monetarily value of when the customers are making those transactions. So if we look into these circles or bubbles or dots, the size of these bubbles, they identify what kind of uh, transactions like high in dollar amount versus low in dollar amount signifies the gap between these bubbles identifies how uh, much time after the customer has come back and made that purchase. And from, let's say, looking from today's timeline versus back, it defines how recent those transactions have been. So looking into these three different examples, of regular customer who's basically making the regular purchases. They don't really have to look too big, but if there might be a instance where, you know, there was a uh, long weekend versus, you know, birthday in the home versus something else and the big uh, purchase happens that comes through. But the majority of the uh, significance of their features is the uh, actually identification of uh, consistent purchases over last three or four quarters. Best valued customer, basically uh, multiple different purchases, and that happens also at a regular intervals. They don't really, again, have to be a very big transactions, but small transactions at every regular interval can identify that. And churned customer looks like that, you know, they haven't really made a purchase in last two quarters, but before that they were very regular. So something must have happened around uh, that time after Q2 that some, uh, these, some of these customers or these specific customers have might turned away. So we use a lot of these hidden uh, values or hidden features. These are all coming from our transactional data. Uh, I mean, if you look into this data, they are just like purchase order or purchase order details. Uh, they don't really attribute these behaviors, but once you put it together through some uh, libraries or identify or extract these features, they really turn out to be very valuable. And we keep modifying or adding more components. Like from RFM, we have gone to RFM T. T is basically the tenure piece. And then we keep adding more and more uh, different features into these particular uh, feature generation phase. So from this point on, as we talked about the churn model, I wanted to talk about one particular scalability issues that we faced because we feed so much data at scale that uh, these model inference times were really, really huge. Uh, uh, I think the very first time we ran it, it took us about 18 to 19 hours to run this whole model on about 27 million customers. With these 27 million customers, we do a weekly aggregations uh, of the features 
and uh, they turned out to be about 2.5 billion transactions that we feed into this model. So what we really had to do is to de-stitch an abandoning layer, which we built in into this model to identify the customer behavior and then reduce the model size from uh, gigabytes to some kilobytes uh, number. And we use this layer into a separate uh, in-memory database, which we'll probably see in some of the next slides coming in. And yeah, the next point is about caching these embeddings in an in-memory database and reading it from uh, when we really needed it at an inference time. So given that, let's look into a model performance and a business results with uh, one of this particular model that we have been talking about, Churn. So we looked into a data processing val volumes of about 25 million customers and 2.5 billion weekly aggregated transactions. They come from multiple disparate data sources and we activate omni-channel campaigns uh, after generating the segments from this model. After at least uh, six or seven different version changes, we had about 88 accuracy with 91% precision on this model, which means it was very, very highly accurately identifying whether the customer would churn out or not. And it had a very less false positives with an F1 score coming out to be about 90%. And that is on one of the regular customers that we have identified as a segment. And when we calculated a hit rate in what happened in actuality, when we did a back testing, it basically proved to be about 67% accurate on that hit rate analysis. What did we really achieve uh, bringing this model and uh, uh, using Databricks as our cluster, uh, which was auto scale in nature and uh, uh, enabling business, uh, uh, one of the business use cases, which is the customer retention. So we had an improved customer retention, definitely, and ability to increase the revenue for a retail, one of our retail client by $2.3 million per year. And that 2.3 million was not even calculated on a complete 12 months time. It was about 10 months uh, in actual processing for this model. We definitely had an optimized marketing campaign dollars uh, came back to or optimized actually into this. And the cost optimization through on-demand auto-scaled cluster was basically about four to five X. In terms of operation excellence, these are about 2.5 billion transactions as I've mentioned before, and they were processed in less than 25% of the time. So the very first run, let's say in our legacy cluster environment used to take 17 to 18 hours, and now it takes about less than five hours to be completely run through on this 2.5 billion transactions and it goes through full scale automation. And it also enables us to go fast, uh, very, very fast uh, to market. The customer benefits around this, we do have a personalized recommendation product uh, engine into this. And uh, there are more personalized offers that we also bring out based on the different products or the category of products better promotional offers and deals based on their lifetime value. So we do have a CLTV model as well in uh, addition to churn, which works hand in hand with both of these models and higher customer satisfaction is what we were able to achieve uh, at this particular juncture when we enable all this architecture and Databricks as our uh, cloud uh, infra for running data distribution using Spark. So at this point, I would like to invite Krish back to uh, identify some of the key takeaways. Thank you, Sharad. Uh, that was a great presentation on the machine learning models and the performance that we saw using these machine learning models running on top of Databricks. Um, so, so let me wrap up with some key takeaways grouped into three categories, data responsiveness and automation. As I mentioned, customer journey uh, to support customer journey, customer identity is foundational. As Sharad mentioned, more data leads to better accuracy and precision. So the more data that you can ingest, the better. Uh, but it's not easy. So you will have to actually start small, but be prepared to scale up. That's where um, auto scale capability of Databricks is vital for supporting this, these kind of initiatives. And responsiveness is a critical thing because you need to be able to deliver the messages to the customer on a timely basis. 
in order to do that, if you can go real time, do it because that's the best way to reach customer at the right moment. To support uh, real time use cases, we need to have faster model training and prediction. And Databricks allows you to scale horizontally and vertically to support that. In order to achieve both uh, the customer experience and responsiveness needs, the entire solution needs to be automated because then only your, your solution can say, scale seamlessly and deliver the right performance and support frequent model updates and in the end be an always on solution for this customer. I know this is a vast topic and we had only 20 minutes to share these details with you. I hope you can actually take some of these, these findings and apply it to your business. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Thank you for your time. So thank you, Krish and Sharad, for that amazing presentation. Um, you know, I, I think it's uh, really amazing what you've built and kind of, you know, looking at the the level of complexity you have both in ingress and egress uh, kind of around your, your MarTech stack is, is uh, quite impressive and the ability to drive uh, these results at scale is uh, also super impressive. So uh, now want to pivot for a bit. Um, we've put together uh, a, a great panel of uh, customers, thought leaders uh, that are coming from across different aspects of the industry to talk a little bit about uh, what they're seeing in the industry. Um, uh, we're thrilled again to have uh, Krish and Sharad stay with us. Um, uh, for those of you uh, who need a reminder, uh, Krish is the uh, Senior Vice President of Technology for Publicis Epsilon, and Sharad Varshney is the VP of Data Science for Publicis Epsilon. Also joining our panel is uh, Stephen Leyland, who's the Head of Data Engineering for Tubi, and uh, last but certainly not least, Arthur Gola, who is the Head of Product Data Science for Wildlife Studios. Uh, before I get into uh, kind of uh, diving into the discussion on our panel, I uh, want to kind of uh, give a little bit of framing for our conversation and kind of what we're seeing in the marketplace right now. Uh, first and foremost, um, you know, a lot of the customers that we're working with uh, over the last year, there's been a, a real focus on anything around real, real time or near real time use cases. Um, specifically coming um, uh, with when COVID started, you know, if you're a gaming platform, if you're a streaming video service, you know, this has been the demand gen, uh, demand gen event of, of all time for you. You know, there are some platforms that doubled, tripled, quadrupled the number of users that were on their platform, uh, which of course led to uh, a issue around, great, we've got all these people. How do we keep them here? How do we mitigate churn? So um, really, uh, you know, focusing on, you know, kind of real-time BI and analytics use cases, as well as uh, any of the kind of real-time action use cases, whether it be, you know, customer lifetime value, next best action, next best offer have been a big focus for what we're seeing uh, in the D2C space, but also, um, you know, more broadly across some of the other uh, uh, businesses that we see in media and entertainment. Um, we've also seen, you know, advertising, while advertising has been hit uh, quite significantly um, coming through COVID, you know, I've talked to customers that initially when this all started, were down anywhere from 10% all the way up through, you know, half of their business was, uh, was affected uh, from an advertising perspective. So while, you know, we, we've certainly seen a pullback in uh, many uh, uh, customers that, you know, are, are you know, doing advertising use cases, what we've also seen has been interesting because we've seen a lot of innovation around use cases, specifically around customers that are looking to uh, drive more into programmatic channels, uh, more into uh, doing more around addressability, uh, and also a really interesting one, and, and we'll talk about this later in the presentation, uh, is customers that are looking at alternative data uh, as a way of understanding campaign performance, particularly with Apple degrading IDFA, you know, customers are looking at new ways to actually uh, to get to measurement. So we're seeing quite a bit of, uh, I'd almost call it a renaissance of, uh, of different use cases that go above and beyond what we typically see in the advertising space. And last but not least, you know, I talked about this in the context of real time and near real time, but there every direct to consumer company that we're working with right now is doubling down on personalization. Um, you know, again, whether it is uh, advanced segmentation use cases, if you're looking to do uh, better targeting uh, for both a direct to consumer and advertising perspective, uh, but also use cases around recommendation engines, next best use cases, customer lifetime value. 
this has been a time where we've seen direct to consumer companies really double down on understanding who is on the other side of their content and how do they use personalization as a proxy for uh, keeping customers engaged on their platform. So with that as kind of our, uh, uh, you know, leading into our discussion and uh, around, you know, kind of what we're seeing uh, in the space, um, want to open it up to the panel, you know, on, on this stage, we're, we're super fortunate to have uh, in Wildlife, one of the fastest growing mobile gaming studios in the world, uh, in Tubi, a massive uh, advertising video on demand platform that, uh, you know, was reported recently, they had uh, 33 million monthly users, which is just astounding. I mean, incredible success there. Uh, and certainly uh, not to leave out, you know, Publicis Epsilon, uh, which really, you know, is, is at the heart of many of these brands uh, that they work with, trying to drive more precision marketing, more personalization, ultimately driving uh, better uh, outcomes for the brands that they do uh, work on behalf of. Um, let's start, you know, kind of uh, hopping on this, this theme I just mentioned around personalization. I uh, want to start with Arthur, you know, Arthur at, at Wildlife, you know, um, uh, during, you know, this, the, this kind of COVID period, this weird time that we're all living through, um, you know, you've seen demand for your games and, uh, you know, it was recently reported um, that you had 100 million monthly active users uh, across your games, which is just incredible. Um, you know, just hearing from Chris and Sherrod on, on the importance of personalization as to their end clients and, um, you know, really how personalization is the core for driving sales, driving consumer engagement. Um, you know, I, I assume for you at Wildlife, and actually I know for you at Wildlife, personalization is, uh, is a big focus. Um, you know, tell us what that means for you in terms of, you know, use cases and how you're applying personalization to drive um, uh, acquisition and uh, insurance mitigation. Sure. Uh, thank you, Steve. So uh, today at Wildlife, as much as like 60% of our revenue comes from in-app purchases, right? So this is true for a lot of uh, companies that work at mobile gaming. Uh, and from those 60% of the uh, revenue that we have at Wildlife, the majority comes from offers, in-game offers. And these offers are basically sales opportunities, right? Where we show the user with a product, uh, like an item that he wants to purchase, some coins, uh, for a price, of course, and with some discount when compared to a regular purchase in the store. And this is very important to us and has been a very important use case that I'd like to mention here as a, a personalization um, use case. And what's very interesting about our business is that basically up to 95% of the users who install our apps never even make a purchase, right? And from those that make a purchase, about 20% represent more than 80% of our revenue. So uh, the, the revenue is very concentrated and users are very different. We have very hardcore users, we have very casual users and being able to separate these different profiles is key for us to, to have a good performance in our games. And to tackle that the challenge, what we did was we built a machine learning platform that basically makes it very easy for a data scientist to build a model and deploy a model that delivers recommendations in real time in our games, right? In the app of the user. And with that, we apply that to offers specifically for these offers that we mentioned. And we had an impact of up to 10% of total game revenue increase uh, and when compared to uh, a baseline of human curated offers. So that was a massive increase, of a massive result and we know we're just at step one. We have a, lo a long way to go. So, so this, is, this is very important for us. And these models today, what we do is we leverage all the information that we have about the user, both about how he got into the app, right? So he came in through the browsing in the app store or maybe perhaps he came in uh, watching an ad on Instagram, this kind of information, but also his behavior inside the app. Right, so this is the key. This is where the magic happens. So we know when the, what screens the user visits. We know every button he presses. We know every point they earn. We know every purchase they make. And, and that amounts to dozens of terabytes of new data every day that enters our system and that we leverage to personalize the user experience. Awesome. Steve, I, I see you nodding your head. You know, you're you're kind of on the opposite end, you know, Arthur's kind of focused on, you know, like how do we, how do we kind of drive more transactions? You on kind of the advertising video on demand side. 
a little bit different, but you know, the kinds of data that you're looking at, uh, it sounds like a lot of it is, is very much the same in terms of, you know, kind of tracking the, the user telemetry. Um, you know, tell us a little bit more about kind of, you know, how you're thinking about personalization, what level of data, what level of granularity you're looking at in terms of kind of getting to this, you know, one-to-one -one, um, uh, world. Sure. Very similar. I mean, personalization is going to be absolutely important for us to, to keep growing, and it has been instrumental in us to get to where we're at today. Um, I think that there are a couple of reasons for that. Obviously, everyone's being a data-driven company today. Uh, but for Tubi, I think the one, one of the big use cases was that our content is just massively large. Our content library has something like 24,000 titles in it, or probably more by now. And uh, I think that's four, over four and a half times larger than what Netflix is offering in the US. So there's a, a massive amount of titles to begin with. And on top of that, unlike Netflix, uh, we don't really have, like, we didn't actually have the luxury of having really high-end content at the beginning. So it was a lot of maybe older content that was transcoded to, from video or reel-to-reel -reel directly into um, digital. And so stuff that just maybe not be uh, as relevant today. And so personalization and recommendation uh, became very important to find uh, what type of content, finding the right content for the right person at the right time uh, to actually drive engagement. Uh, and that, that was basically uh, key. So the way we did that is we, it, we invested pretty early on in a, in a context-rich event stream, similar to what we were just talking about. So we, oh my gosh, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> So we, we invested in a content-rich uh, event stream, and that has a lot of detail on to basically when, it, when a video started, what video started, um, where they were at, uh, what the um, what what uh, form factor they were using, and then all the way down to like what they what their interactions were with the Tubi application. Um, so you know, pausing a video, fast forward, rewind, uh, rotating the Android uh, device to from landscape to portrait mode, anything that can signal more interaction or more more um, engagement. Uh, we take all of that into an ingestion pipeline, which currently is somewhere around 40,000 messages a second, uh, and about not as, not as large as what we were just talking about, but about 500 gigabytes a day compressed of our, of our enriched data coming in. And that forms the basis of everything we do from our KPI metrics that we, that we use in our, data, in our data warehouse dashboards, as well as our A-B testing uh, experimentation framework, as well as driving the training data for our, for our recommendation models. Um, so that's basically what we uh, focused on early on to get to where we're at today. Awesome. So it's like Arthur, Steve, you know, big, big focus on kind of, you know, managing scale of data, you know, streaming is a big thing for, for both of you guys, it sounds like real time. Um, you know, uh, building on this a little bit, Christian Sherrod, you know, uh, clearly based on, on the presentation, we just saw, you know, personalization as the core of everything that you are delivering. Um, you know, it, it, you know, with anything with personalization and what we've heard from Arthur and Steve, there's a lot of dependencies. There's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of kind of uh, both data come on the ingress and egress to make all of this work. Um, as you've kind of, you know, developed your deployment, as you've gotten further along, you know, what have been the key learnings uh, for you as you've matured around building a lot of uh, these use cases out around personalization? Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, you raised an important point. In fact, uh, omni-channel personalization, as, as we heard today, is the holy grail for marketing. Uh, effective personalization requires understanding customers and knowing when to contact them and when not to contact them. That's also equally important. And customer identity is a prerequisite for a number of business activities enabling personalization, such as progressive profiling, 360 degree customer view, customer journey analysis and orchestration, targeting, attribution, and media frequency capping, et cetera. This is something you typically encounter with any MarTech system. In order to get the personalization right, you need to ingest and stitch together a diverse set of data. We heard some of the numbers like terabytes of data uh, coming uh, into, into the gaming platform and um, say gigabytes and then the video streaming earlier uh, when Steve and Arthur 
uh, talked about. Uh, so in the same thing, uh, in, the, in the same context, ideally you would start, in order to build a personalization solution, you start with the identity at the core and layer in uh, information such as profiles, preferences, transactions, and behavioral data. What we have seen in the past is that you can start small, start with whatever data sets you have, but you should be ready to scale up on demand, both from an ingestion perspective as well as on a compute perspective. And Sharad will talk about more on the machine learning aspects of this. Sharad, take it away. Thank <clears throat> Thanks, Krish. So just to expand a little more on the uh, customer journey analysis and orchestration and the customer identity, which Krish were talking about, we use that data at scale. And just to name, let's say the example that we were talking about personalizations, we have the personalized offer recommendation engine, which uses uh, the models underneath, but that models really work out when we put all this data at scale behind to this model for their learning and inference. We've trained just to you know, talk about you know, what kind of a platform and the transactions that we have used for Ingress is about 2.5 billion transactions when uh, we do it at a weekly aggregation level. And when we infer upon these, it's about 30 to 40 million uh, rows, which goes out as an egress through a segmentation tool and uh, to our next level, which is the uh, audio intelligence uh, filtration. So this using data at scale for training and scoring is what we really need to continue optimizing as a part of the process. When we start with a very small data through experimentation and when we build a production-based pipelines, all this data really comes to play. And we have used Databricks, auto-scalable clusters, and optimized Delta Lake to process all this data in our models using uh, Spark data frame, which is fully distributed across the whole cluster. And just to take an example, we use about 1.5 to 2 terabyte uh, cluster to spawn all this data into uh, Spark and feed this through uh, using either the batching techniques or even the parallelization uh, framework uh, with any deep learning machine uh, uh, learning libraries. So over time, this processing, uh, it used to take 17 hours uh, as in, you know, a previous kind of a stack that we were using. And now with Databricks, it has gone over uh, given us about four to five X kind of optimization. Wow. That's, that's, uh, that's amazing. And, and certainly, you know, as, as kind of the, the business is demanding more of uh, these real time use cases, you know, certainly something that, uh, that is a, a differentiator for you. Um, it, really good segue, um, Shred, as you're talking about scale and, you know, I, we've heard from, um, from all of you guys, you know, that, uh, you're dealing with tremendous amounts of consumer data and, uh, you know, the ability to have performant and reliable streaming pipelines is absolutely critical and at the core of making all of this work uh, to get to some of these real-time use cases. Um, starting with Steven, you know, I would love to um, talk about uh, some of the challenges that you've had um, in kind of getting, you know, more performance, more reliability out of, uh, out of you know, your, your pipelines for, for some of these real-time or near real-time use cases. Sure. I think the biggest challenge we've had, uh, so we've been, our, our machine learning pipelines were originally batched. Our recommendation was originally batched and we're still trying to get to more online serving of the recommendations. And so the training of that pipeline and getting the training data uh, running through the entire uh, the entire end to end pipeline took not too long, but about six hours overall. And so when, if we did have a problem, you know, and it's expensive to rerun every single time uh, and and also, if we do have a problem and it takes two days to update the, the recommendations and we have stale recommendations out there, uh, we are serving real-time recommendations through, uh, you know, on the, to the clients. It's just that those recommendations might be stale. We want to basically move to more like right after a user watched a comedy episode. Now we want to say, all right, use that as more training data and get, get a better prediction for the next uh, recommended video. And that's, that's what we've been, been focused on right now. Uh, the main issues I think that's kind of hurt us is that our feature engineering or feature extraction right now is all kind of, um, we don't have a central feature store and we've been building that out, trying to create a feature store that where we can reuse the same features over different models. We don't have different machine learning engineers writing features in separate ways, uh, that sort of thing. So we're spending a lot of effort towards uh, building out a centralized feature store so that that can be used 
Uh, and then, of course, we have an online feature store and feature like uh, syncing the offline and online feature stores are, are challenging as well. Um, I think those are the biggest challenges that, that we're facing right now and getting to near time predictions. Uh, uh, Chris Sherrod, you know, you, you had mentioned, uh, you know, kind of a 17 hour uh, kind of uh, time to run some of these uh, use cases for you. You know, you're, you're taking in again, you know, this is massive scale where you, where you really need, you know, uh, agile platforms in order to, uh, to deliver. Uh, tell us a little bit more about some of the challenges uh, that, that you had in this area as well. Yeah, to, uh, let me ask you something. What annoys you most about digital marketing? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question, but I'm I'm the uh, leader for media and entertainment, so I can't. I, I don't know if I can. Uh, I can. I can tell you without. Uh, <laughs> probably things that are not relevant to to me as a consumer. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, absolutely. So for to me, it's repeatedly seeing an ad for a product even after purchasing the product. You we all might have run into this, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, that, uh, so for example, you are. Uh, uh, in the market for shopping a car, and um, then yeah, you visit a number of OEM sites and other uh, review sites. Uh, even after you make the purchase, you will see a number of car ads every day. Uh, that doesn't go away for, for quite some time, right? Uh, so this is a problem that uh, the marketing, the advertisement, advertising industry is trying to solve. And in fact, we addressed this issue recently for one of our retail clients. In near real time, we had to make uh, a decision based on the fact that whether a person has clicked on an offer before purchasing something online, or they had actually presented a coupon in store while making a purchase. So you know that the person has redeemed the coupon or the offer, and then we actually had to detect these events and then suppress the messaging delivered to this individual after he or she had made the purchase. And then we diverted our ad dollars to target individuals who hadn't clicked on the offers or redeemed the coupons yet. So this is a near real time scenario. So we had, in order to accomplish this, the transaction uh, information had to be brought in from the enterprise service bus in real time. And we had to map it to specific marketing campaign and he had uh, initially enabled through the legacy technologies, but uh, Databricks uh, structured streaming made our lives a lot easier as we were able to apply real-time analytics on top of this data while we are actually ingesting and processing and then making recommendations. And uh, Sharad will add to the, the machine learning complexities involved in this. Thanks, Krish. I think the question is about the real-time processing. Uh, most of the machine learning models or deep learning models that we use, they're not designed for real-time, right? So you need to really uh, complement lots of infrastructure pieces around uh, making these uh, analytics really real-time. So when I talked about those 17 hours of processing, it's really processing about 2.5 billion transactions. So when we think about real time, it's probably we're gonna feed one single row to get in for right at that particular moment in some, let's say some milliseconds based uh, uh, timing. So I heard Steve also mentioned a couple of different points about feature engineering. So in our architectural slide, uh, we do show the feature aggregation being a centralized point. So a lot of uh, manpower goes behind that to make sure that you know, we have the features that we define uh, in our modeling. So when we use these models, uh, just like examples Krish mentioned about uh, uh, marketing campaigns, we empower these campaigns behind uh, from all the machine learning models behind. But these models were done for uh, batch processing, but using that real-time analytics or having to do those uh, batch processed data kept into, let's say, a Delta Lake, which we have it from the Databricks, really have it seeded to align with the campaign. And when it get, needs to be delivered, basically we just do the Delta Lake-based queries to identify you know, which customer we really need to look at and just provide the inference output for that. So just to go back into the example, uh, there is a post-purchase-based uh, uh, use case that once I have really bought a product, 
I don't really want to see that advertisement keep coming back to me. So if we have enabled uh, either those promo redemptions based use cases or the post purchase use cases back into these layering, we could also identify that the product has already been bought and uh, to show those advertisements around those product might be just a waste of uh, money and time for our consumers. Awesome. And, and um, Arthur, uh, kind of wrapping up uh, with you, you know, uh, we kind of, you know, scale, agility seem to be kind of things, themes here. You know, tell us a little bit about your experience and, um, you know, kind of some of the challenges you've had to overcome in getting to some of these uh, real time use cases. Yeah. Uh, so basically, we see a lot of use cases that are very, very valuable, right? Deliver a lot of value to the business. And to get to them, you have to do a lot of work, right? There's a lot of free work. And the funny thing about having a robust data platform is that uh, in our case, at least, it costed way, way more than we planned in the past. But that's actually a good thing. Uh, not for the cost itself, of course, but because we are doing way, way more than what we planned we would do. And of course, way more than what we were doing before. So basically, uh, before we, we uh, started using Databricks, um, we were in a situation where our data engineering uh, team was basically focused on maintaining services and not building the structure that we need to build upon and to do new stuff. And as we got like this platform that released it time from these engineers, they could start working with uh, actually, you know, first making our core pipeline very robust, then moving on to other applications, more advanced applications, improving our data analytics platform, uh, advancing in real time data uh, and everything that has to be built to allow for our personalization use cases that we are mentioning here. So, uh, basically, when you have a platform uh, that gives autonomy to people, uh, what you have is the use cases explode, right? The number of use cases explode because you give autonomy to people and it's only limited by their creativity. So basically the analysts and the data scientists creativity is what uh, is between here and, and, you know, a lot of new use cases and a lot of value generated to the business. I think that this was really uh, cool. And that's why I said, in the beginning that we it costed more than we planned because we are doing way more than we planned and the ROI of that is huge. So yeah, that's great. It's almost like, you know, platforms are like a gateway drug, <laughs> I, I guess. Um, so pivoting, uh, pivoting um, quick here, um, you know, clearly, you know, we're all, we're doing this presentation all virtually because uh, many parts of the world are still locked down. We're still living in this, uh, very odd time of uh, you know being in a, a global pandemic, um, and it's had an impact on every business. Um, and certainly, you know, we've seen our customers that have had to change their approach. Um, uh, you know, you see, you know, we've, we've heard from Arthur and Steve. You know, they have you know record consumption in their platforms. You know, for for Chris and Sherrod in the advertising world, it's had to change the approach and kind of drive more creativity in terms of how you actually get to a end consumer. I uh, just want to kind of go around the, the horn here and see, you know, how has, how has COVID had to kind of change your approach to the types of use cases? You know, have you had to adjust the, the work and the groups that you're working with? Uh, Chris Schrader, I'll start with you on this one. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, as, as you mentioned, right, uh, definitely uh, the, the content consumption and, and even the shopping behavior of the consumer has changed since COVID. Um, so uh, as you can see, there's record media consumption um, that's happening around the world, right? On, on all the, um, the digital platforms, uh, be it Roku, be it um, Hulu and like other streaming services. And of course, Steven uh, has actually mentioned that uh, the, the, the platform usage is through the roof. That's awesome. Um, uh, so, um, and it has definitely opened up avenues for online advertising. But I wanted to actually focus on two different verticals that I closely work with, retail and CPG. Uh, so our retail clients uh, are focused on spending their ad dollars on driving more online traffic. So they want actually, since the stores are not open, they want people to buy, shop online, buy, buy online. Um, however, 
the CPG uh, clients are facing a different challenge, in, uh, especially in the, in the consumer goods section. Things are flying off the shelves. Um, so they, they have a different problem. So they are, they are actually running into a supply chain optimization problem to actually refill or restack these products on shelves. Um, so at the same time, retailers are also facing some kind of supply chain challenges, especially to support shipping because um, if you have a retainer uh, who are, who's actually primarily a brick and mortar shop, you had a lot of uh, stores, physical stores, uh, your inventory has already been distributed into this uh, physical store. Um, now getting that inventory back into warehouse and then shipping it out is going to be a challenge. So ideally you should actually ship it out directly from store uh, to the end user. So there are these um, supply chain optimization problems that we have started enc encountering with these, these uh, industry verticals. Shrad, anything to, uh, to add there? Sure, uh, I'll add some machine learning perspective to this. Uh, same example, right? CPG product, uh, let's talk about canned food. Uh, during this pandemic, COVID-19, and even let's say California fires with cyclone hitting all the uh, Gulf Coast. Uh, what it really does, uh, people buy in bulk, they try to stockpile uh, these kind of products. So, I mean, the team sitting behind the scenes, what they're thinking is we don't really need marketing to uh, market these products. What we really need to solve is a supply chain problem behind the scene and we need to accurately do a demand forecast around these products. Uh, what we really need to do is to basically pivot really, really quick during this pandemic situation and uh, not think about marketing solution, but also go into demand forecasting with supply chain. But demand forecasting is a kind of a uh, solved domain per se in machine learning. But what it really hasn't done is to feed these kind of indicators which define the urgent need of these particular product in either local market or some national markets. So that what we really had to do uh, during this COVID times, uh, identify some of these key indicators that could drive these models and really uh, fit together back into these kind of pandemic situations. It's really interesting and a, and a good segue for, for Arthur, you know, when we, we talk about kind of uh, demand fulfillment, uh, you know, supply chain, well, well, certainly not the same parallel from CPG to, to gaming, um, you know, you, you've seen an incredible amount of growth and uh, have had to very, I'm, I'm sure, had to very quickly pivot to uh, ensure that you have systems in place to capture this growth. Tell us a little bit more about, you know, um, you know, did you feel like the systems you had were, were set up to handle the surge and any, any kind of learnings that you've had during this time? Sure. Um, so I think that all our systems are designed to auto scale, right? Uh, in, in, our, in our business, in our, in our market, what happens is we have to, we will have fluctuations and big, big fluctuations in downloads and active users like all the time. Uh, just for like uh, a little bit of reference, when we launch a game, we can have up to 10 times the installs that we'll have on, on steady state. Uh, when, when our app gets featured in the app store, for example, we could get even like double the amount of downloads of a regular day. And our systems must be able to handle this kind of load and this kind of fluctuation, right? So I think that, so COVID in, in terms of engineering, we were very well prepared for it. Uh, I think that one interesting case where we had to adjust and we had to adapt is uh, we had this inflow of users and we also have new users, uh, we ha also have old users who started engaging more with our products, right? And we also, on the other hand, we use that information to model the lifetime value of these users, right? And of course, the behavior these users will have in during the quarantine, during COVID, and the behaviors they have as we uh, let loose some of the social distancing uh, policies that we have changes, of course. So we had to adjust our LTV models to take into account that, you know, the, user the users will not be as good as they are right now. Uh, and that's okay. But of course, uh, as you said, it was uh, like very positive for us and drove a lot of users, a lot of revenue uh, just from this period, yes. 
Stephen, uh, uh, kind of pivoting over to you for a sec. I mean, you, you lead a data engineering team. You know, you've uh, similar to Arthur. You know, demand has been uh, at a at a high. Uh, you know, has has this changed any of the way that you've had to operate, or or some of the new use cases that uh, that you've had to enable um, uh, from your team? I would say I don't think we've had to do anything different on as far as the use cases go. Uh, but similar to Arthur, you know, most of our cases have been, most of our backend services are set up to auto scale. So we've managed to handle surge quite well. Uh, even the, the, the data pipeline that we've had has been relatively, I guess, self-maintaining for a while. It just kind of, more data comes in, more data right, writes to the Delta Lake. It's, it works pr pretty, pretty well. Uh, actually, sometimes it works too well. We didn't have a, we didn't have a, enough notification in place because we just didn't really think that things need to be monitored a lot. It just worked. Uh, and so we just found out recently, actually it was a couple weeks ago, that uh, we started getting seeing more lag and started seeing more, uh, it taking longer and longer for some data to get through our data pipelines and into the, into the recommendation system uh, or our online, uh, we have a, a Spark streaming job for that does a lot of uh, real-time sessionization. So creating all these sessions based off a bunch of, uh, of events and uh, we had a lot of issues where the, the the session data would just drop because it was too old outside the watermark things like that and we, it took us a long time to figure out what the heck was going on and it's all the result of you know demand going up uh, data kind of kind of slowing down a bit and then and then you know we figured it out and now things are smoothing flowing really smoothly um, and outside of that uh, just like everyone else, I think we saw a big hit in advertising spend early on. Uh, and then once April, May starts, like the ad dollars start trickling back in, uh, you know, our revenue starts going up. Um, but our TVT, our, our total view time uh, metrics definitely had a huge surge uh, over the pandemic and continue to grow, as I just mentioned. Awesome. So we've only got a couple minutes left. I, I want to do quick roundtable uh, before we wrap here on you know, we, we've talked about, you know, scale, agility, personalization, we've talked use cases. Um, but, you know, as you guys are looking out over the next 12 months, um, again, want to want to kind of make it a sound bitey since we're short on time. Uh, what are what are kind of use cases that you're looking forward to or, or kind of innovation that you're looking toward uh, over the next 12 months? I'll start with uh, Arthur. Cool. Um one innovation that I'm that we are working on and that I'm very excited about is uh, in our personalized offer system, the one that I described before. Uh, we basically spend a lot of you know blood, sweat, and tears into building the platform and making it run, and it gave great results, right? So we kind of like bought ourselves some time to do new stuff and to experiment on new stuff, and we are going to use this time, and we are using this time to experiment on applying reinforcement learning approaches to uh, selecting the best action that we can do to, to each player. And this is super exciting technically. Uh, it solves a lot of our problems like just in one swing, uh, but it's also a big risk because you know, reinforcement learning approaches uh, tend to have very uh, uh, you know, high variance in results, right? Uh, and so it might not go anywhere. So that's a very big uh, innovation that I'm very excited about. And I'll probably share with you guys the results that we have in the near future. Awesome. Steve, any, anything you're, uh, you're looking forward to in terms of use cases? Sure. We're powering more and more uh, deep learning, I think. Uh, basically, more, we have a, a data platform similar to Arthur, but maybe not as robust. And building out a data platform such that users can can experiment on deep learning models easily and quickly and, and making that iteration time uh, very slow. That's basically our biggest challenge for this next, uh, the next year. That includes things like the feature store that I mentioned earlier and more work around real time, just moving everything to real time, real time features, real time training, um, and then obviously real time serving and predicting. And last but certainly not least, Chris, Sherrod, anything as you're looking out over the next 12 months you're excited about? Yeah, so we are focusing on a number of things, but uh, I'll talk about a, a couple of them that I, I'm, I'm close to uh, working with. Uh, the first one is uh, the identity-based recommendation. So we currently do uh, recommendations uh, based on customer identity, primarily on the digital media display side of things, but we are actually actively looking to expand this capability to support websites and other digital channels. So that's one initiative that we are working on. 
Um, second thing that I'm currently involved with is the partner integration. So we have a number of um, activation channel partners that we work with, including Adobe. So we're in the process of creating an integrated identity offering with these partners. So those are the primary activities that I'm working on. Sharab? Yeah. So a lot of innovation has been going in uh, in our platforms. What we used to call our machine learning platform is marketing machine learning platform, but we definitely innovating that is to a supply chain based uh, machine learning platform as well, in addition to marketing machine learning. So a lot of uh, uh, supply chain based innovation has been going in for uh, us just from the R&D perspective, but to grow these uh, toolkits into our different and more modular approaches. We have Deep Speech 2 model being implemented, which is basically using speech to text based use cases. We also have a next best action uh, model coming in. I think something which Arthur uh, talked a little bit about. Uh, it's basically uh, uses reinforcement learning approach to try to uh, optimize on certain campaign dollars versus you know whatever the objective is. It tries to uh, try to optimize it little and little better using uh, incremental approaches. So awesome. these are few of the innovation we are looking at. Well, this has been super, uh, a super great conversation, guys. Really appreciate um, your time and your willingness to tell us more about kind of uh, what you're seeing in the market and kind of uh, you know where you're where you're taking your deployment. So uh, with that, we could not be more grateful for your participation and uh, thank you again for all the insight. Wow, what an awesome panel discussion. Thank you, everyone. And that's all we have for today's inaugural Data and AI Industry Leadership Forum. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time.